Welcome to The Link. I'm Brandon Johnson with Voight Johnson Real Estate, and today I have the honor to be joined by John McGee with uh, St. John's Prep School. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks for having me on. A lot to talk about. It's not your typical 2020 year, especially in the world of education, correct? Correct. It is a year like no other. So this summer has been filled with an atypical summer. At at a normal school, um, that would be a normal elementary, secondary school, college, or university, uh, the pace of life slows significantly in the summer, and it's a time when people recharge and they regather their energy for another new year. And there was, there's been no real opportunity to do that this summer. <laughs> it has been um, an incredibly busy summer trying to plan for and prepare for a fall and a fall where we don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. Right. Um, so it has been, um, when people ask me, well, what kind of summer have you had? One like no other. For sure, for sure. And that, I think, goes for most of us in some regard or another, right? Right, exactly. Um, well, let's get into that a little bit later, but I want to go back and just a little bit about where are you from originally? What's your background? Um, right. What do you like to do? What was it like growing up as a kid? Sure. Um, um, I was born in Schenectady, New York, which made me different and interesting growing up anyway. Um It's in the Capital District in New York. All of my relatives still live there. Sure. In the Schenectady, Albany, Troy area. Nobody from Minnesota, a few people in Minnesota have heard of Schenectady, New York. Um, But was raised in Minnesota. My parents moved to Minnesota when uh, I was very young. I have have three brothers, and we grew up in Mankato. Oh, okay. And in North Mankato. Sure. And uh, I'm pretty sure we were the last of the free-range children (laughs) in that era of children who grew up in a time and in a sort of, when I look back on it, an idyllic kind of life where you were sent out to play at eight in the morning and you came in at noon when one parent in the neighborhood yelled sure. for lunch. That meant it was everybody's lunchtime. Same for dinner, same for coming in at yep. night. It was an incredibly idyllic way to, um, to grow up. And I'm actually sketching out for real a book about uh, one particular summer. Yeah. of growing up as the last of the free-range children. Um, but I, uh, I went to Mankato West High School Okay. in, um, in Mankato. The Scarlets, right? The Scarlets. Aaron would know exactly. that. Exactly. We were the Scarlets. Yep. And I'm really happy to say that along with Governor Walls, I'm a, I did for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, I was inducted into the Mankato West Hall of Fame um, in 2018. Sure. Um, and so... Um, loved the place, got to go back for homecoming cool. for the first time since I graduated in 1980. And, it, and I realized I was the old person that we thought was ancient when I was a student <laughs> yeah, sitting yeah, in the middle yeah. of the gym. Yeah. But it was just a spectacular time and I got a terrific education. I went to St. John's University. Sure. Um, I'm a Johnny. I graduated in 1984. Um, I've actually spent, because I subsequently worked at St. John's and St. John's and St. Ben's, I spent about 40% of my adult life at St. John's or St. John's and St. Ben's. Yeah, it's been really, um, St. John's has been central to my life and central to the life of my family. I mean, I'm, I'm also, I'm married to a St. Ben's grad. Sure. Um, I, we have four children, um, all four of whom have either graduated from or one still attending St. John's prep. Yeah. So they've gone to school on campus. Two of the three high school graduates um, went to or are at St. John's. So there's a theme here. Yep. So um, It's ingrained in the fabric it of is. here. It is. I worked as a vice president for planning and strategy, had several different titles. That was the last one. But I was vice president for planning and strategy for St. John's and St. Ben's from 1999 until 2019. Okay. Um, so, uh, the middle of 2019. So, I was there a very long time. Had an opportunity to, um, to apply for the position at St. John's Prep as head sure. of school. Um, and so, just a had, year ago, then? Just a year ago. Okay. Had kids at the school, loved the school. Our kids were fabulously well educated. We'd become a part of the fabric of the school. The school community had become a part of us. Yep. And um, it was. It was such a great opportunity. So I threw my name into the ring um, and um, 
went through you know all the requisite interviews. The last one, the one where I got to be on campus yep. and meeting people, was a snowstorm. <laughs> so the way we're talking today is the way I was interviewed. I actually didn't meet. I met very few people that day, and they it was video recorded. They could see me. I could yep. not see them, um, and it was a fantastic day. Um, it, it was completely different, and uh, but still really enjoyable and. When they offered me the position, um, I was both grateful and anxious to take it. Yeah. And the well, last it's an year, honor, right? It's I mean, a complete honor. And the last year, pandemic notwithstanding, has been incredible. Uh, we have we have amazing students, smart, curious, funny yep. um, students. We have uh, really dedicated, supported families. I work with faculty and staff who are remarkably dedicated to the school and to their students yep. and to our students and their families. Um, it is completely fortunate um, and every day I'm grateful that I um, have the opportunity. I have a work. question and I'm trying not to be out of line or more my novice. I'm Lutheran so I'm kind of the JV squad of Christianity. <laughs> really? Is that the way you um, <laughs> <laughs> but has the head of St. John's Prep traditionally been some sort of clergy, right? Uh, I... Yes. In okay. fact, I am the 30th head of school at yeah. St. John's Prep. St. John's Prep was founded in 1857, which that in and of itself by St. John's Abbey, who was new in the United States sure. at that time, um, uh, that is a remarkable story itself. Um, St. John's Prep, St. John's University, founded in 1857. Um, we are the oldest continuously operating high school in Minnesota, secondary school in Minnesota. I'm the 30th head of school since 1857 and the first non-monastic head of school since 1857. That's what I had thought, so but I wasn't positive. The, yeah. the first person who's not been a member of St. John's Abbey, which is both um, an extraordinary honor and privilege For to sure. have that, uh, to be the first, um, as well as a responsibility to carry on the legacy that so many other people had built and developed over such a long period. What of was that like? Was there some on the interview process? Was there some? I'm assuming there was a board or a panel mm -hmm. making the hire. Was there some more traditionalist, some not, or was that not even a consideration at all? The, whether I was Catholic or not, no, or whether, had that uh, had been a part. They had monastic. decided before the search started that um, it did and not the Abbey had decided that um, th that um, the search would be open to non-monastic. To non monastic sure and so the Abbey had decided that which um, was a significant decision for them to make all the more reason for me to be both honored and to exercise this yep. position with great care yep um, very humbling I'm sure it be. is completely humbling it's a trust yeah and it's it's a it's a 163 year old trust to inherit um, for those listening that aren't familiar with St. John's Prep at all, maybe just give the brief synopsis of sure. what the school, sure. what grade levels, yeah. what the mission of it is, and yeah. just a little bit of a synopsis of the school. We are a 6 through 12 um, secondary school. We board students, meaning we have a residence hall, sure. for students in the upper school, grades 9 through 12. Um, it was historically a boarding school. It is today... Um, male and female. Male and is today yep. male and female. It was historically a boys' school. Yep. It went co-ed in the early 1970s. Um, today, day students make up in the neighborhood of 80% of our students, 75% of our students are, um, are day students, meaning they live mostly within um, either the St. Cloud, Central Minnesota area, a radius sure. of about 50 miles from campus. Sure. Um, we enroll students of all faiths and, uh, and religious backgrounds. We are, a Catholic, we are a school in the Catholic Benedictine tradition. Um, and the way we most simply describe it to our families is that we prepare our students for lives of purpose, service, and achievement. And all three of those mean something. Sure. Um, it is a prep school. Achievement and rigor and academic excellence are central to who we are. But purpose and service are central to the Catholic Benedictine values that we um, that we hold, that are that are central to our being and are and are part of our being at the school, um, we uh, we take those very very seriously. But the practice, the Benedictine practice at St. John's, is also highly inclusive and welcoming, which is why it's a comfortable school 
for students of all faiths. What, um, what's your rough estimate enrollment? And then what's the demographic, just local central Minnesota kids versus all over the country and even international? What's kind of the sure. paint me a picture? So we enroll, we expect to enroll this fall or in any given year, we'll enroll between 260 and 280 students okay. in those grade levels. Um, the major, as I said before, the majority of our students, about 75%, keeping in mind that the middle school grades six, seven, and eight are not boarding grades. So those would be all day students. Understood. Um, or nearly all. We have a couple of boarding students, but nearly all day students. Um, so in the upper school, boarding students in a typical year, and I'll explain in a moment why this upcoming year won't be, yeah. but uh, boarding students comprise about 30%, 30 to about a, up to a third of our upper school students. The majority of them are international. Um, we boarded a total last year, inclusive of students that we enrolled from an exchange program we have from Austria. We had 56 students last year wow. from 14 different countries. Wow. 56 boarding students from 14 different countries. Um, which, yeah, it creates this remarkable kind of world experience. I mean, we're a world school. We truly are a world school. There are all these different languages spoken in school, and it's great to watch, for example, on a playing field. And my kids played soccer. And at any given time, on our soccer team, there were at least four or five languages that they're speaking yeah. out on the field. And, um, you know, it's a world school in two directions. We're attracting students from the world to yeah. St. John's Prep, to this place in the middle of a campus, in the in the middle of a county, in the middle of a state, in the middle of the country. Yep. So we're doing that right here. But we also, we have, um, we have several global exchange programs for our students, essentially what, what at the collegiate level would be called study abroad programs, not just kind of week-long pieces, but semester or extended periods of time overseas. We have a year-long uh, program that's actually our legacy international program is with the school in Melk, Austria, where we exchange students. They come to us for a sure, semester. Sure. We send students there for an academic year. Um, and so we're sending students out to the world as well, and, it, and especially perhaps at the end as high school graduates, as they um, uh, we're sending them to colleges all over the country. I yeah. mean, they're, they're, their collegiate universe is the universe of colleges. It's yeah. not... It is not geographically circumscribed. Yep, very cool. That the international, what you described on, just you think about in the school setting, from the cultural mm -hmm. diversity, but also just in the day to day, the sports right. and the right. That just offers so much more. It um, does, from and an it, experience, and it, and it causes it, it causes our students, but certainly our faculty, staff, and families, for that matter, to think differently about global issues. So for example, when the coronavirus was first identified as an issue, and as it was identified as an issue in China, in the Wuhan province sure. of China, um, our, the first note we sent to our families about coronavirus was February 5th, long before anybody here was thinking about coronavirus and what, could, what it could mean here. But we sent a note to our families to say, you know, um, this outbreak in China is, is significant. It's on our radar. It's on our radar, but we also want you to exercise great care and compassion for the students that we have from China. They're a long ways from home. Please support them as their families right. are wrestling with this home. We had a reason to do that. And that's when you realize that this, there aren't even six degrees of separation. Yeah. That in fact, we share this same terra firma um, and the same air, and it isn't just about central Minnesota or even Minnesota or even the United States. We are all citizens of the world. For sure. So you brought up, you mentioned COVID. Mm -hmm. So when that start to escalate, let's mm -hmm. say into March, what did the end of the school year yeah. look like for you or how did you transition? Sure. We were the first school in the area to close, to, to toggle from... Um, on-campus learning to e-learning um, because we had a family member in our community was had a positive test and at that point there were very few and we knew a lot less about clearly everybody right. knew a right. lot less about COVID then and so we made the decision on March 12th 
to, um, to transition to e-learning. Um, that e-learning began uh, full on on March 16th. So the day we started, that week was the week the governor, the governor announced that two weeks later the all schools in, in Minnesota yeah. would close and the shelter in place order. Yeah. Um, so we did, um, what we did that was different though that I think um, many other schools either chose to do or were able to do is we delivered our regular curriculum um, online through the day. We did it through the way most people did it was Zoom right. or that kind of technology. Right. And we kept our regular eight period day throughout the pandemic. And what that meant was that every day um, our students could at least virtually see each other and see their teachers every day. And an eight o'clock class still meant an eight o'clock class as did an 11 o'clock class or a two o'clock class. Yep. And um, now a lot of our kids, I think, did a lot of that, did a lot of their courses from their, uh, from their bedrooms in their yep. pajamas, which yep. would include my own daughter. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it kept for them and for our faculty as well, a kind of consistency that yes, it was disruptive. Yeah. And yes, it was different, um, but our faculty met continuously throughout this, uh, working together to say, hey, I've learned this in doing this. Yep. Maybe we sh what have you learned? And then they, they kept adapting their teaching throughout that 12-week period. Um, and so while it was not normal in the way we think of normal, um, we still kept a day a day. Yep. And it kept structure and continuity in our students' lives. In addition to that, um, our student council programmed through the pandemic. They did a series of virtual events through, um, through the pandemic. And some of our teachers were involved in that. I think we had, what was it? We had chess Wednesday or Thursday. I mean, we, there were days where there were these activities that were planned that people could join in. And they did. Yep. Um, we did a couple of pieces where our teachers, um, we did a food, th this was like, like this actually. Um, we, one of our teachers did a food program, one of our teachers did a birdhouse building program, another of our teachers did a let's paint together, uh, our art teacher yep. did a let's paint together yep. program for, for our community and our families and our, even our alums, yep. and those were well attended. So we tried, the thing we didn't want to lose sight of was that in switching from what was normal to what was different, I don't want to use the word abnormal, but just different, what we didn't want to lose was the life and spark of the school that made it interesting and valuable and purposeful. We didn't think we needed to give that away, yes. and we didn't, and it was hard. I mean, all of it was difficult, but in the end, we surveyed our parents, um, which we surveyed our parents, our students, our faculty, at the end of the school year, how did this go? Yep. And um, one of the questions we asked two parents was, how satisfied were you sure. with your daughter or son's e-learning experience this spring? And 88% um, described themselves as satisfied or very satisfied. Now in Minnesota, um, although none of, nobody preferred it, but given the context and the conditions, they were, they were satisfied. Um, I was grateful that the Department of Education then did a statewide survey of parents asking a similar kinds of question, you know, um, how would you describe your experience with distance sure. learning this spring sure. on their scale, same five point scale, but they went from very good to very bad. And 53% um, of parents said it was bad or very bad. Wow. So our, our parents and families had a different experience than what parents and families broadly um, expressed in the state so um, I thought we navigated that um, yeah. really really well, well the word and you said that I picked up on earlier was adapt mm -hmm. and I think that's what you describing the food curriculums the chess and um, to the ability to adapt in any setting education right. business I mean I've mentioned this before and to the people here that um, what we've gone through this spring with COVID hasn't, it's just accelerated, in my opinion, what's started to happen or play out in so many aspects. You look at oh, yeah. businesses in the mall that I think, you know, stuff, it's just accelerating trends. We're having to adapt so much quickly to some of this 
distance Absolutely. learning where we've gotten, I hate to use this word in a lot of regards, but complacency sets in, in every facet. And then on a dime, we have to shift out of necessity. And so I think what you just described or walked us through is how quickly you were able to make that transition period of adaptation um, this spring, which leads me into what you have, you mentioned this summer has been a whirlwind planning for the fall. Yeah. Talk about now what, what does this fall look like sure. on site and how are you preparing sure. for all the health concerns as well as sure. education? Let me frame that in this way too, yeah. since earlier you asked me, you know, a little bit about me and what I do and yeah. who I am and what do I enjoy. Um, I've written a couple of books. Um, and um, that's good because I've read a couple, maybe not yeah. more. Than. <laughs> well, one of them, only two. One of them was <laughs> one of them was written to parents. Yeah, it's called Dear Parents: A Field Guide to Preparing for College. Yeah, and as a parent of four children and somebody who worked in higher education a long time, I thought I could write an interesting and having kids go through that process. I thought I could write a book about that, and I did, and it was a blast. To write yeah, um, but I wrote one about the uh, changing marketplace for higher education, but really all of education. One of the chapters, the last chapter in that book, it was called Breakpoint. Um, I entitled the chapter, Think Different. And that was the, the name of the advertising campaign that Steve Jobs initiated when he came back to Apple in 1998. I've seen that speech. It is the Think Different campaign, yep. which only ran for six or eight months, was brilliant. Yep. Brilliant, and as I looked at it, as I was writing my book, um, first of all, every, he, think different isn't correct. It's not, it's not grammatically correct. In fact, it is because he used the word different as an abstract noun. And he didn't mean to use it as an adverb. And so when he said think different, he didn't mean think just, think differently about something, but actually think different, be different. He was trying to cast Apple as different than yep. um, competitors yep. and other products. And and he did it brilliantly, and they succeeded with that. That, to me, um, you know, as I was writing and putting that into a book, um, that became something of a leadership mantra. Yeah. Think different. It isn't just differently about the same thing, but how do you how do you think of yourself as different then, either because conditions have changed or because you need to think different anyway? Um, Johnson Voigt Voigt Johnson needs to be different than other firms, not just act differently, but to actually be different. And so as we approached um, planning for the fall, and even as we thought about last spring, it wasn't enough to just retreat to the tools that we had. We had to think different about the way we're going to provide education. So we did it with three broad purposes in mind. Let me start with, we plan to open for on-campus instruction on Wednesday, August 26th is our first day of class. Okay. Um, we would have been anyway. We open earlier than any other school in the area. Um, but um, And this year being first may actually really mean something <laughs> yeah. um, because others will want to know how it goes, at least in the first week or two, um, for us. To get to that, um, we had to first answer the question, why? Do you want to open in person? Um, and the, the, the short answer to that is because we're better together. Because community is central to our values as a school. It's essential to the Benedictine values that inform sure. who we are and guide us. Sure. And so this idea of being together and the idea that being together in a way that's not just kind of transactional, I te you right. teach, I learn, right. um, but Going transformational the yeah. in the sense that um, magic, almost magical things happen when we're together. So that was the, the, the why piece of it. Yeah. The how pieces of it, there, th there were three broad objectives. The first was, how can we do this in a way that um, where we can create health and safety protocols that reduce the risk of infection and disease trans transmission? Health and safety had to be our first priority. For sure. The second was, how could we create a learning experience within those parameters that, in, that maintained our commitment to academic excellence and rigor and to a community experience? And the third was, 
how can we create an experience within those two parameters that ensures flexibility and adaptability for conditions that we don't know how they're going to change because we wanted to ensure that our students have a continuous and as seamless as possible experience yep. through the year, even as we thread a needle for changing conditions. Because we don't know what we six know. months from now, let alone two we months We don't know from six now, weeks from now. Right. And so, so those were sort of the three guideposts that we played to on the how. On the health and safety side, um, which is where most people go first and sometimes last, yeah. um, but it's not last. But, um, but to go first, the easiest decision we made, and first decision we made, it, long before it became, before the governor said anything about it here, is we were going to require masks. Okay. And we were fortunate that um, we, we, we created a series of committees to develop our plan, which we call Prep Forward. Okay. Um, our reopening plan and academic plan for the 2020-2021 year. Um, and we also viewed it that way as a whole year plan, not just a how are we going to reopen plan, yep. but how are we going to do this through the year. And on our health and safety team, um, we, had, we have a number of our parents, our medical professionals, and we uh, were grateful that two, two doctors were part of our health and safety team and their guidance was really invaluable. But we decided early on two things. First, that everybody would wear a mask all day, every day in school. The second is that every single day to come into school, it turns out now we're gonna use an app. At the time, we thought we'd be using paper. But um, every day you come into school, you have to indicate that you've passed a symptom screener. So sure. you have to ask a series of questions. Have you had any of these quest any of these symptoms? And is your temperature below? And you're you taking take your temperature temperatures. every day yep. at home. And will, you know, for, for kids who forget Understood. who don't have it, we can do it at school. Understood. But that, those are two preconditions for being entering or being in the building. Those were really significant preconditions. Um, beyond that, then you know, we, we addressed cleaning protocols, yep. distancing in classrooms. Um, how are we going to staggering some um, uh, times you know, when students are moving? Yep. Where were they going to eat? Repurposing um, some spaces. Um, those were all significant. But the, on the learning side of it, the key decision that we made was to extend what we did in the spring. So we are offering all of our classes essentially in three formats, um, live, in person, sure, live, remote. So every class, every classroom will have in it an Be iPad. Broadcast. We'll be, have an iPad mounted on a tripod. All teachers will wear a, a, a headset, microphone yep. headset and um, it'll be broadcast on Zoom because we knew that there were going to be students who, first of all, if you got sick, right. or even if you didn't get sick, if you were quarantined at home, the ability um, to go back, and you could still attend class yeah. live, not get behind. Um, or for students, and we do have a number of our international students either can't make it back at all or on time yeah. this fall, and some whose families wanted to stay at prep but weren't sure they wanted to send their children right now because they read the news right. about pandemic conditions in the United States and weren't very comfortable with that. Yep. And so, um, so they intend to study from thousands of miles away. And so they can, they can do that via um, live remote. Yep. In other words, it'll be Zoom. There's no such thing as a snow day anymore. There is isn't. <laughs> That's right. To the, to the terror and horror yep. of um, yep. perhaps not just students, but faculty and staff too. Yep. Everybody likes the occasional snow day. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we're also recording each class so that they'll be available uh, asynchronously as well. Because if you're six, seven, eight, ten time zones away, right. um, it's, we're offering class in the middle of your night. Yep. And so, so that's been the signature way for us to ensure continuous instruction and not simply provide kids who aren't in the building with, here's some information you're at home. Yep. Um, we wanted to make it as as live and as connected as we could. Let me ask you this, and I'm not uh, trying to put you on the spot too much, but was there any, 
you mentioned about all the safety concerns mm -hmm. for the students. Was there any apprehensions or questions just on staff, sure. teachers, and how did you handle that? Sure. That or what? Well, um, we're all, everybody's nervous. Right. We don't know. Um, we, in addition to providing, you know, in addition to wearing um, or having, everybody has to wear a face mask in school. Um, our director of residential life, his mother has a 3D printer and an avocation and made 60 face shields for all oh, wow. the faculty and staff. So we That's have innovation. those as well. We've tried to set the classrooms in ways, we are setting the classrooms in ways and teachers were involved in how much space they wanted sure. for themselves in the classroom. Um, this is of course the great unknown for everybody. We've yep. taken the steps that, um, that follow the guidance that we had yep. to create as, uh, as much safety as we can knowing that there was that in the same way being here with you today or going to a store or uh, there was no way to reduce that to zero yep. and we've acknowledged that um, and we have to pay very very close attention to that yep. and um, and yeah people I think until there's an element of this that until you live it we don't we'll see how it we're going to learn how it goes. It's a balancing act, right? It is. Um, it is. You, there need to your point earlier is there needs to be some semblance of normalcy, but yet we need to take the precautions. Right. Um, and I think this has been great. I know Aaron reached out to me. I, what I think I want to do is just give more exposure to Thank you. everything that's going on out there. And this time of year is it's rather timely with kids going back to school. Go ahead. Let me let me just say something I said to our seniors in the fall, or in the spring. I'm sorry, last spring. But it applies to going back in the fall. We have two choices at this moment. Um, we can let this moment define us and what we do. Yeah. Or we can define this moment and what it what it the way it challenges us for ourselves. The latter is the far better choice. Um, we can choose to be. It, it is frightening. But we can choose to have fear be the primary emotion, um, and it's real. I have to acknowledge that. Yep. It's real for everybody. Yep. Um, but we still need to define this moment for ourselves rather than simply letting this moment define us. Yep. And so, um, yes, it promises to be a year of different and uncertain and requiring a great commitment to flexibility and adaptability. But two things. One, I believe we're up for the challenge. And two, I think that um, this is our moment, to air, a moment for us to define, not in a defiant way, but to define um, um, who we are as a community, who we are as, as leaders. Um, for all of this to work, it isn't just about what the school does, it's about what every student faculty and staff member does it's the what what, fac what families do at home too it's how we work together to protect each other to ensure that we can be together safely yep. as best we can to have a year that even though it's different it still can be a remarkable year because just take this one group if i'm a senior i'm not interested in saying it's a lost year it's not a lost year let's make it an amazing yep. year even though it's different. And I said to our seniors last spring, you will never remember, you know, you will never forget this year. You will not remember um, what didn't happen, however. Right. You will always know that you made it through this and, and it'll be special in that way. Our job as a school is to educate and form our students as best we can yeah. and to provide experiences that position them to develop and grow as young people, um, and in our case too, prepare them for the next great adventure, the next yep. great adventure in their life, their collegiate adventure. And we hold ourselves to that, pandemic or no pandemic. Yeah. Well, adversity is a great opportunity for growth, correct? It is. And I think that's what you were alluding and to. And as a leader, people are watching us. They want to know that we're acting like leaders, which means they want to know that we're taking care of people, yep. we are care about people, but they also want to know that um, we have a variety of their interests in mind. For sure. 
Well, John, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Um, Thanks for if, having me. Absolutely. This has been fun. I enjoy yeah. these, uh, for me, great depth conversations. Um, if people have interest, how do they get in touch with you or what's your website? How do they SJ get? Prep net is our website our reopening plan is on our website that's the place that's right on the top of the front yep. page of our website so www.sjprep.net um, and they can reach us that way and they can call us at the prep school at 363-3315 I have I spoke to a uh, high school teacher in Cold Spring a couple weeks ago and he said you know, with all parents just trying to plan, right. um, he said he had written a number of letters of recommendation for St. John's Prep as students, you know, n unsure of what the fall was going to bring. And so I think the value is awareness to bring another option. Right. And you've obviously got this as well as can be um, laid out there for what your plan for the fall looks like. So thank you for stopping in. Thank you so much for this in. opportunity. Thanks, Brandon. Yep. Bye-bye.